Um, without further ado, let's get started with our little bit of introduction here. So, um, hi, my name is Tiffany. I am one of the two co-directors, as well as Arpin, who's the other co-director. We are part of a five-director team with Half for, within Half for Impact UIUC, and we're so excited to be sharing you guys, uh, sharing with you guys today our product showcase. So, um, looking at all five projects we've worked over. Uh, worked on over the past semester. And yes, I'm going to hand it off to Arvin to discuss more about Hack for Impact. Hey everyone, so um, odds are you've probably heard a bit about us by now, but just to give the quick rundown about who we are and what we do, um, our mission is to unite students to build well-engineered, well geocentric, and impactful products for social change. So there are a lot of ways in which you can do this, but the way that we do this usually is by partnering with nonprofits um, in order to build some sort of software that meets their needs. Um, Tiffany, if you can go to the next slide. So uh, you'll see five different project teams and one of our um, other, another of our product research teams present today. So these teams are all um, students here at the U of I and um, part of Hack for Impact. Teams are led by a product manager and a tech lead. Um, most members on the teams are software developers and we also um, might have a product designer on the team depending on the nature of the project that we built. Here are a few examples of past nonprofits and past teams that we've worked with. So um, Hack for Impact was founded back in 2017. Um, so fall of 2017, actually this is a national organization that was started at the University of Pennsylvania and we were one of the first of the other chapters to join the national network. So over the past four years, the organization has grown a lot and evolved a lot. I have been here for three years now. So in my time here, I've been glad to see the way that it's evolved and how we can continue to hone our mission and see how we can make the most impact with the work that we can do. I'll hand it back to Tiffany to talk about some of the past partners that we worked with as well as more specifics about our work. Yeah, so we've worked with a variety of past nonprofits, um, focusing on a variety of different fields, be it immigration, early language literacy, environmental advocacy, whatnot. It covers a wide array of different interests and sectors here. Um, and through our different work, we've been doing different technical projects ranging from web apps to mobile apps to data science apps. However, most of our apps do focus on the web development side, as you'll see in our presentation today. So our current partners this semester include Southside Weekly, which focuses in on journalism in the Chicago area, Falling Fruit, which is an urban harvesting web app um, that is located internationally or can be used to find um, fruits and uh, other vegetables and such internationally. 3DP for me, which is a nonprofit focused on creating 3D printed hearing aids for those in the Middle East. Menti, which is an international nonprofit focused on um, immigrant um, mentee and mentorship uh, aspects and the local YMCA in the form of the New American Welcome Center, which welcomes immigrants to the local Champaign-Urbana area. So without further ado, we're going to get started on our videos today, which are the most uh, interesting part of our presentation. It'll take up the majority of them. So our agenda as follows currently will be uh, YMCA, then Falling Fruit. However, um, due to some technical difficulties, we will be putting Falling Fruit at the end of today's presentation. Then Southside Weekly, 3DP for me, Product Research's presentation, with Product Research being the team of our organization that focuses on sourcing our projects, and then Mentee. So Arpin, I'm gonna hand off screen sharing back to you so you can get us started. Yeah, so I'll be playing these videos on my computer. Um, so hopefully everything will go fine with regards to the, um, all the Zoom stuff with sharing screen. Um, I, if there are any issues, I'm not, I don't know if I'll be able to always see the chat. So let me just speak up and unmute, but um, I'll get to start with the YMCA. So, I uh, hope you all enjoy this, and here is our first presentation for today.
Good morning and welcome to YMCA Knock. YMCA Knock is an incredibly important organization dedicated to helping immigrants in Champaign. It's here that we bring some of our biggest innovations to life. And we have not stopped innovating, doing the work that will enrich people's lives for years to come, because we're all looking forward to a more hopeful tomorrow. That's why we believe it's so important to showcase Oasis this year. And while it cannot possibly feel the same in here without you, I can assure you that we have a great show ahead of us. This year, we're delivering the conference in a whole new way to all of you around the world, directly to your home. And we want to welcome you to our home here at Hack for Impact. I'd like to first talk to you about two big things that are happening in the world right now. To start, I want to address the topic of immigration in Champaign. Today, there are over 24,000 immigrants in Champaign, and that number is only increasing. Starting life in a new country isn't an easy task. People may not speak your language, finding a job is difficult, and raising children all at the same time makes balancing it all even harder. For new immigrants, it's hard to know who to trust and how to find the resources you need. And that's why we created the Oasis. We believe in a future where immigrants can be empowered to find resources on their own, and those providing can connect with those in need. With our partnership with YMCA's new American Welcome Center, this year we're excited to present to you exciting new features to Oasis that will increase accessibility to resources for all residents in Champaign for years to come. Today, we're going to push each of our platforms forward in some exciting and breakthrough ways. With that, let's get started by sending it over to Jackie. Good morning. Great to have you here. As you can see, we've got a lot to cover. So let's get started with Oasis. This year, we spent time rethinking some of the most iconic elements of the experience on Oasis. Now it all started here with a carefully considered features that increase accessibility to resources for immigrants in Champaign. Of course, over the years, we kept the fundamentals largely the same, but carefully added features like resource map view, language support for Spanish, Chinese, and French, translation verification, resource category management, and data exporting, and so much more. This, let me give you a quick peek. This is going to be amazing. I'd like to welcome Ian for a live demo. Thanks, Jackie. I'm really excited to show you the map view. So before the semester, we already created a grid view where immigrants could see resources around the Champaign-Urbana area. But to specifically see what's nearby, we decided to create this new and innovative map view where immigrants can provide their location into the search bar. So let's pretend like we're lamb and we're starting at our home address. It was a late night yesterday. Uh, what's cool is once you provide your address, it'll take you there on the map and the list of resources on the sidebar will update based on what's closest to you. Uh, we can go through this paginated list uh, and see what we're looking for. Ooh, this really catches my attention. Uh, it was a bad rough night last yesterday. Uh, when you click on a resource, a nice modal pops up containing a short description, uh, some basic contact information, and some quick commands. You can get directions, you can save it to your list of resources, and you can share it to a friend. I think this map view is really cool because once you zoom out, you get to really just see, okay, what's around the Champaign-Urbana area. It kind of makes you see why YMCA is such a great project uh, and all the resources that we're providing to immigrants. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Luciana to talk about language translations. Thanks. Ian. Since we launched multiple language support, it's completely redefined what immigrants can do. So we've been working on translating the website. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see a drop down menu where you can select which language you'd like the website to be in. We have English, Spanish, French, and Chinese right now. Um, so everything gets translated into uh, the respective language you select. And then in mobile, we have a very similar menu on the sidebar. 
um, and then you just click which language you like and everything will change into that language. Mm, so here you can see um, another page, uh, the resource page in Spanish. Um, so you can just go to a resource mm, and then everything will be tr translated to Spanish. Now these translations, however, are automated. So we've built a feature to validate these translations, which I'll pass off to Neha to show you. Thanks. Luciana. Let's take a look at some of the enhancements. Translation verification. Como oasis I can't wait to show you our new Nehasan feature, translation verification. Let's say that I'm the admin. Wait, admin it. How will I keep track of the unverified and verified translations? Luckily, there's a translation verification table. I can see the resources for all the languages here, Spanish, French, and Chinese. All these resources here have been unverified, just like my Instagram status, because they need attention. Whereas under the completed tab, there will be resources with a verified status, meaning all of his translations were verified, but there aren't any at this moment. The resources here that need attention are sorted by priority. There's urgent, high, medium, and low. If a resource has been reported, it will be marked as urgent. And the other priorities depend on the number of verified translations. So a high priority in this case would have a low number of verified translations. But if this were a low priority, it would have a higher number of verified translations. This allows the admin to see which translations need to be addressed. And by clicking on the translate link, this leads you to the edit resource translations page where the admin can edit the translation and verify it. So through this table, the process of verifying, keeping track of verified translations is organized and efficient. Now I'll pass it back to Jackie to show you our new admin dashboard. To tell you more about our new admin dashboard and how it will take Oasis to the next level, I'd like to send you over to Michael. I'm so excited to give you a tour. So we've added an admin dashboard that centralizes all the admin functionality into one place. Uh, we've also added a manage resources tab that allows you to easily edit the categories and subcategories of any resource. So we can also add, edit, and remove different categories. So we can create a category really quick here. As well as add a new subcategory. And then on the right hand side, we can also edit the categories of any resource. So we can add this new category and we can also remove it. And then if we don't need the category anymore, we can remove it, edit the name, whatever we want. Finally, we want to thank the dedicated people everywhere. We are really, really excited in all the progress that we have made. Um, and we think that we are going to be in such a great place in terms of our community once we're able to launch Oasis. Um, and it's all thanks to the hard work that the students in Hack for Impact have put in. Um, and for all of our clients, we're gonna be looking forward to this service and to be able to have this available at our community. So we're really, really thankful um, to have been able to build a long-standing partnership with Hack for Impact and for the impact that we know they're gonna have um, in our community. Every single person who's worked on the YMCA project over the last three semesters, and most of all, the YMCA New American Welcome Center employees and translators and everyone else along the way who have helped made Oasis possible. And hopefully Oasis will make a lasting impact for the immigrants and residents of Champaign for years to come. Thank you. All right, that wraps up our first presentation from today, um, opening it up for questions. So if you um, have a question, feel free to either raise your hand on Zoom or leave the question in chat, and then we'll get to each of the questions uh, one by one. OK, hopefully an easy question to start off with. <clears throat> My sister privately messaged me this, but Lamb, what was the song at the beginning for like WWDC when you guys were like going through uh, a demo? That's a good question. Tim Cook actually reached out for me to make this video. I don't, I couldn't tell you, so you'll have to just DM him personally. <laughs> um, it's, it's probably on the WWDC video. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I can't answer that right now. Sorry. <laughs> All right. 
Yeah, so Sahi asked a question in the chat. What was demoing slash launching this product like a few weeks ago? This was actually a super exciting milestone for us. We've worked on this for three semesters and kind of our first time we actually launched this was a couple of weeks ago. It was really great. Uh, we had a lot of great feedback. A lot of the NOC employees and stakeholders were kind of there. They gave us great feedback that we actually used to help you know build some of the features that you see here in this kind of ladder of the semester today. So it's a really good experience. We're actually planning on launching. Um, it'll be launched publicly on the website, hopefully sometime in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and we'll kind of get more feedback from there and we'll see how it goes. But hopefully we've impressed you guys enough to, to see that, you know, the immigrants in Champagne will like it too. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What are you guys most excited about for the future of your partnership with YMCA? Uh, yeah, I can take this. I think the coolest part of this, I think, as we mentioned, there are 24,000 immigrants in Champagne, and that number is increasing. I think at one point, uh, so don't quote me here, there's actually a report on the website, but I believe close to a fifth of all residents of Champagne are immigrants. And so I'm actually really excited that one of the coolest features we added this semester was actually doing uh, language translation. So now Chinese, French, Spanish uh, immigrants who weren't able to speak English before can actually use our website accessibly. So we're really excited to see hopefully those, trans those translations work. We also have a feature to validate translations because Google Translate uh, doesn't always do it well. So hopefully we don't get too many kind of error reporting. Hopefully there's not any mistranslations from Google there. Uh, but yeah, we're excited to see how the immigrants use it from here on out. <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> great question, Yusuf. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I so that was something we were actually um, looking at this semester because um, there are other New York and Welcome Centers throughout the country. Um, I think. Maybe Zayan and Lam might be able to talk more about that. Zayan is our product research lead, um, who is kind of spearheading that with Lam. Yeah, sure. I think it would definitely be something that we um, we did explore somewhat this semester. I think it was a matter of just gauging interest from other um, opportunities from YMCA's. So we initially reached out to other New American Welcome Centers, but if other YMCA's are looking for something like this, um, feel free to contact us. I'll drop my email in the chat. Yeah, just to add on to that, we, we do hope to expand another Knox eventually. We'll just kind of have to facilitate that bridge and see what happens from there. Uh, really quickly, there are two questions in the chat. One is private message me to me. So I want to ask what was the most challenging part of working on this project? I think the most challenging part, something we actually didn't expect at all coming into it was the fact that we had to make another feature to validate translations. Uh, we didn't really know how to kind of approach the language translation at first other than Google API, but I don't know, I'm sure you guys have experienced this, you know, in AP Spanish or high school Spanish, you can't pass any Spanish exams with just Google Translate. Uh, so we have to have people, real people actually verify that. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges, making sure we can actually make it so that this is accessible uh, to immigrants and that it's basically extensible and autom automatable by the actual translators who know these languages well moving forward. Uh, Faith also asked in the chat, a lot of the projects you worked with are from all across the the globe, most of the like working with not local nonprofit. I actually think that was, uh, I think it was nice to have to work with the local nonprofit because I got a lot more context on um, specifically about, you know, regarding champion immigrants and how we approach them in this area. I think the nice thing about having a local nonprofit is that they're are a lot more kind of specific details to address regarding, uh, things specifically about immigrants in Champagne. Uh, in a sense, it might have made our job a little bit easier because we could focus on the top three translations uh, in Champagne directly rather than maybe the 180, probably over a thousand languages globally that we probably that Google Translate probably can't even do or we don't have enough people to do. Um, oh yeah, and then Sabelle asked, are there any plans to add more language translations? Uh, there hopefully are plans to add language translations in the future. Um, that's probably one of the features that if, if we do partner again, that would be working on making that dynamic, um, but that will kind of be spearheaded you know, mainly the, the big 
blocker there is that we need someone in person to actually validate those translations. So while we can expand it to as many languages as Google API offers, we are limited kind of in human capacity, people who actually speak that language to verify it in person. <clears throat> yeah, great question. I will also add on maybe um, to Faith's question about working with a local nonprofit. Um, this semester is a little different because of remote and everything, but um, the first two semesters we got to work with Knock was was super awesome because um, we got to meet with them in person. I know like Tiffany and Annie did a lot of user research in person um, with like real users and other nonprofits, um, which was really awesome to do and it's kind of a different experience for us as well. All right, in the interest of time, we'll be moving on to the next presentation. If you do have any questions left for YMCA, feel free to leave them in the chat and the team will be able to um, respond to them in the chat as well. So um, the next presentation today is from one of our new uh, projects this semester, Southside Weekly. Guys, the weather today is like amazing. You know what would make this day better? Mint chocolate chip ice cream. Oh my god, Same. yes. Same, yes, oh my god. Hey, I'm live from the situation with a report regarding a shortage of mint chocolate chip ice cream in Illinois. This has been personally affecting many, including myself, as I sit here with my empty box of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Let's see how others are handling the situation. Dude, that's literally crazy. We have to do something about it. Let's go. Where are you guys going? We need someone that can help. There's Stop a guy right there. We need help, we need help, we need help. I don't know if you heard, but there's no more mint chocolate chip in Illinois at all. You Please need help us. I don't know how I can help y'all with that, but um, I know this guy Jason. He runs uh, the newsroom for Southside Weekly. He loves mint chocolate chip, so good try talking to him. All right, Jason, mint chocolate chip, Southside Weekly? Yes, yeah, let's go. All right, guys, so we found someone that can help. Uh, we have to find a Jason, uh, Southside Weekly, Most and the chocolate chip. Yeah, but where's Southside Weekly? I think it's in Chicago. Chicago, Chicago. Union. Union. All right, three, two, one. Wait, this is the wrong union. Let's try it again. Tell us a little bit more about Southside Weekly. Yeah, definitely. So the Southside Weekly is a nonprofit journalism outlet located on the South Side of Chicago. We started in 2013 uh, with the mission to provide quality arts, culture, and politics coverage, as well as to be a place for to educate and develop emerging journalists and artists and media makers. We had a lot of people uh, sign up to be contributors. We had about a thousand people in the last two years sign up. Um, so that's a lot of people to sort of keep track of for such a small staff. So that's why uh, we're working with Hack for Impact. Can you tell us a little bit more about this dashboard project? Yeah, so um, since we have so many people um, signing up to contribute in various ways and taking on various assignments, we need a database and dashboard solution that helps us track all of that. And so Hack for Impact has built a, um, a product that allows contributors to sign up on our website, um, give us some information about what uh, kinds of topics they're interested in covering, and then pick up um, pitches or uh, submit pitches, um, as well as pick up various uh, other assignments like um, fact checking or photography for projects that are already in the works. So for instance, you could submit a pitch about 
uh, the you know mid chocolate chip shortage. How is your experience working with Hector affected? It's been great. Um, I'm really impressed with uh, how you guys, how the team has been able to sort of um, deconstruct. I think a very sort of complex problem with a lot of uh, a lot of moving parts and. Um, the product is, uh, it's beautiful and uh, I'm excited to, to be using it. Hey guys, I'm an editor at The Weekly. I heard from Jason that you're interested in pitching a story about the shortage of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Yeah, um, how can we get started on that? First, you'll have to sign up to become a contributor, but it's just as easy as one, two, three. So this is the onboarding form that you'll have to fill out in order to become a contributor at the weekly. Ooh, super cool. Let's fill it out now then. Great, we can skip the onboarding call that we usually have since we're in a rush right now. I granted you access to the dashboard from my end. Let's go ahead and set up your profile page real quick. Awesome, before you make this pitch, I highly recommend that you run through our writer's guide on our resources page. Um, I think there's no writer's guide here. Oh, we recently revamped our writer's guide and removed the old one, but forgot to add the new one in. Let me do that real quick. Wow, this is really helpful. Thank you. Now we feel so ready to start this pitch. We just submitted the pitch. We're gonna save mint chocolate chip ice cream. Perfect. Now it's time for me to review your pitch submission. This looks great to me. I think we are going to need two writers, one fact checker, and one illustrator for this story. I just approved the pitch. Next, we need to find contributors at the weekly who can work on this story. Typically, contributors would submit requests to claim a pitch, and after approval from staff, they would be able to work on their respective story. However, since we are on such a tight timeline, let's just look through the directory of contributors to see who might be interested in working on this pressing mint chocolate chip story. This person named must have seems like he's a chill dude. Maybe he can work on the visuals for this story. These contributors look like they would be a good fit. Let's slack them and get this story rolling. They all agreed to work on the story. Wow, what a rush that was. But that this dashboard looks amazing. Is it because you guys conducted user testing while building it? Could we hear a little bit more about that? Yeah, let me pass you on to the designer of our dashboard. He's also a mint chocolate chip lover. User testing is extremely important to validate any assumptions, find flaws, and make improvements in a design that may not have been so obvious before. One of the biggest improvements that we made was changing up the wording of the dashboard. On the left hand, you see the old dashboard, but the wording is just not personalized. It's just a submitted pitches, claim pitches, and it's very vague. On the right hand side, you see it's less vague by including the simple word my. The user now knows what they're looking at, and there's no confusion as to what what's theirs or what's not theirs. Another big decision we made was changing up the flow of the submitting a pitch modal for the contributor. On the left hand, you see we're asking them to suggest roles and all that, but we were told after user testing to make it a little bit simpler and easier to look at. So the modal on the right was what we decided on to make it simple and very user friendly for the contributor. The most interesting part of designing the dashboard was making sure that all the user flows across contributors, staff, and admin were all consistent with each other so that if at any point the roles were adjusted, there wouldn't be a learning curve in trying to figure out the new system. That's it for user testing. Let's head back to the situation room to hear from Sahi. What a day, what a day. I know that I'll be leaving Illinois to get some mint chocolate chip ice cream. 
Anyways, thank you for taking the time to listen to this breaking news story about mint chocolate chip ice cream, Southside Weekly, and Hack for Impact. I hope you all enjoyed that um, skit and presentation as well, uh, opening the floor up for questions again. I think uh, one question also for all of our external members, if someone can explain the whole mint chocolate chip joke, I think that would help them a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so the product designer and our team who you also saw in the video, Mustafa, um, when he first joined our org this semester, he gave a little introduction in our UIUC introductions channel, and he said that he dislikes mint chocolate chip ice cream. Um, it became a whole thing, even went on to Twitter and stuff, like we've got Slack reacts going. Uh, so yeah, we kind of just built it into the, the skit. Alice, you want to take this one? Tiffany asked the question. Yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, I really enjoyed just like seeing the actual newsroom or I get seeing Jason in person too, but like just seeing all like the newspaper stacks and like the awards. Um, apparently there is also a guy there who like owned, at one point used to own like 50 newspapers in Chicago. And I was just like, whoa, that's really cool. <laughs> Um, and just like seeing all the rooms that they collaborate in, um, although not many people were there because of COVID, but um, yeah, and, and definitely hearing Jason talk about how much he enjoys our product in person was, was really cool. Um, Danielle or, Adit not, yeah, Danielle or Aditya or Amit can add on to that. I can add on to that a little bit. Um... Basically, I think one of my favorite parts was the actual SSW office, like the um, office they were working on it was connected with like several other small businesses. And like, so when you walked into it, they had this like back room area where like there's this big common space and a big like area where everyone could like hang out and present stuff. And it was just like a really cool building layout and to see how like the news like room functioned out of like all of it in a collaborative space. I also really enjoyed right next to the Southside Weekly building, there is like a little coffee shop um, that they also had like free Southside Weekly newspapers there. And just going there um, in general just made me really like realize how my product is actually going to affect this nonprofit and the people who this nonprofit affects. And that was really, um, that was really interesting and moving for me personally. Yeah, it looks like the next question um, is about our plans for the summer, and there's also one about next semester. So over the summer, I think we're just going to focus on um, finishing up, like closing any PRs that are open, um, as well as cleaning up our repository. Um, and next semester, we're actually going to have a new designer on our team, and that's the first time um, that sort of happened in Hack for Impact, so we're putting together a designer handoff doc. And then next semester, we're kind of um, focusing on um, just adding more to the high priority features, wrapping those up like the admin homepage, as well as sending contributors any notifications um, via email, for example, when their pitch submission or pitch claim has been approved or rejected. Um, just those kinds of things, as well as after that, we're probably going to be moving into focusing on visualizing some things for admin, such as like contributor demographics and stuff, because that's pretty important for Southside Weekly and other news nonprofits when they're applying to um, get funding, for example. So that's sort of a summary of things we're gonna be um, working on. And let's see, can you talk more about what your partnership partner relationship was like this semester? Um, yeah, I think like 
it's a it was pretty much like a typical partner relationship but um at the same time like I, I think it's been going well like we've had a lot of fun talking to our partner almost every week um and sort of envisioning this dashboard that um right off the bat we kind of knew was going to take more than a semester to build so talking about a long-term partnership and also um, this semester when we conducted user testing getting the chance to talk to others at the the weekly including um, editors and contributors uh, staff members so that was pretty exciting um, I think we have a really cool partnership um, going right now and we could potentially even scale this product so that um, other news nonprofits can use the dashboard as well so we're looking forward to that and then the most challenging part of your project I think I'm going to hand this part off to Mustafa to talk about the design aspect and then Alice to talk about the technical aspect well like on the design end of things the challenging part was just trying to figure out a consistent flow to use because right now from what we had Southside Weekly was pretty much form based with the whole process right so trying to figure out an easy uh, flow for the contributors to follow that wouldn't break their you know like how they do things at Southside Weekly but also make it make things easier because we don't want the learning curve to be intense where we lose uh, already uh, onboarded contributors but we also didn't want to you know like completely like change their whole like, perspective of how salsa weekly operates so just between that and like just trying to build something from the ground up like we did have you mitch mock-ups but they were like very like p negative one no offense to them so like we're trying to go off of that to get to p zero and up above that uh um yeah but uh i'm gonna, say, I'm gonna give it to alice before i say anything that i shouldn't have <laughs> okay cool <laughs> um so i think one thing that is not just specific to me that was really challenging was like I'm a new tech lead, Sahi's a new PM, and most of us are new designers. So like all of us collaborating together when we're so new is like pretty crazy, as well as this is like a new project too. Um, I think for tech lead specifically, like I guess this is also similar for like all first semester projects for tech leads, but it's just like pretty hard to flesh out like what you need or like what, what the nonprofit needs in the beginning. And then like, how do you convert those into actual technical features? Um, and then some of our like details and requirements kept not kept changing, but like they changed from time to time. So then like, how do you adjust um, the actual features of the app to handle that? And like, uh, another thing is like, how do you generalize some like shared components across the app so that you don't have to keep rewriting the same code over and over? Um, yeah, just stuff like that. And then I think the next question is, how did Hack for Impact and Southside Weekly find each other? So last semester, I was actually the product research lead. And on the product research team, we source and scope our future projects. So we found Southside Weekly towards the end of the semester um, when we reached out to news nonprofits after actually Alice um, recommended that we do so after she saw an episode of the Patriot Act on Netflix. So yeah, that's what we did. And that's how we found um, Southside Weekly. So yeah, and then the next question is, can you tell us a little more about the user research process? Who did you talk to? Did you give a full demo or just walk through of designs? What should future projects doing user research keep in mind? Okay, yeah, so actually the interesting thing is we didn't um, have the time to conduct user research, which we usually do in the product research um, stage because we found Southside Weekly towards the end of the semester. Um, however, we did uh, still send out like a form to the contributors to sort of get information on what they want, don't want, um, all that good stuff. So that was really helpful just being able to have some takeaways from that um, in aggregate form. And then, yeah, typically like we like to have like user interviews and stuff, but we sort of did that later on when we um, made the time to conduct user testing this semester. And we talked to like all three different kinds of users, contributors, staff, and admin. And that was um, really helpful for us. Most of put together some interactive Sigma prototypes. And then we sort of went through those, asked them to run through several use cases, see how they interacted with the application and make conclusions off of like what's intuitive, what's not intuitive from there, as well as just like get on their feedback on what's like helpful and not. But yeah, I think we're gonna wrap up questions there. Thank you guys. Wait, wait, Arfin, do we have time for one more question? Um, I think we can answer that in the chat if possible, but uh, I think we, for interest of time, we're going to move on to the next one. All right. So um, the next 
presentation is from one of our returning projects this semester, and this is uh, 3D for me, which stands for 3D printing for the Middle East. Um, so I'll start that off. Hello, this is 3P for me. This is the second semester that Hack for Impact has been working with 3P for me, and we've been working hard on some features that we will hope will improve the sustainability of the project and also allow the platform to be much more robust with new admin features. Jason, the head of 3P for me, has really enjoyed working with us. I wanted to share a few words about his experience with Hack for Impact as well as how the project could benefit 3P for me. Hello, everyone. This is Jason with uh, 3DP for me, and I wanted to take a minute and just thank the whole uh, Hack for Impact community. And especially I wanted to thank Evan and, uh, and Matthew and, and Gene and all the others who've helped 3DP for me to create um, our initial software. And uh, just really excited about the potential and kind of what we're building for now and the future, uh, especially in terms of our upcoming pilot uh, to collect uh, our clients' initial data and take a photo release form and a number of other things that the guys have worked on. Um, but I think specifically our software integrations and then also with some of the technology APIs. So I think without the Hack for Impact team, we would be far away from many of these things. So I think your direct impact on helping us to not only get off the ground, but also have the infrastructure to build, I think it's very exciting. and. Uh, I think with all of my heart, I just wanted to thank you to everyone for all your hard work. I know it's a journey. We're not there yet. It's a pro process, but I think I'm excited about, you know, three to five years from now, you know, what this infrastructure means for us to not only help uh, people with hearing aids in Jordan and Syria, but potentially around the world. So thanks again, and uh, have a wonderful day. Take care. Hey guys. So. Our main deliverables for the semester are that we completely implemented our dynamic front end, we added audio recording to our platform, and we our application is completely deployed using Elastic Beanstalk and ready for use. I'm so excited to join 3DP for me, but oh no, I don't have access to the platform. I guess I gotta go find an admin. Please don't keep her. Hey, admin. Hey, what's up? I need access to the platform. Yeah, sure. Just send a request on the dashboard, and you'll add. You'll automatically be added to a list of uh, pending users. Sounds good. over the account management page. As we saw in the video, the volunteer has to request access to the platform by signing into their Google account, and which then in turn sends a request to the, uh, to the dashboard. In the dashboard, the admin can actually either give the volunteer access or not give them access. There are four different tabs, all users, active, pending, and revoked. These tabs help us categorize the different users on the dashboard. We can also manage users on the dashboard. So if we hit the edit button, we can actually see a menu come up here. This menu contains their name, email, the roles they're assigned, and their access level. Now that we've seen how we can manage user access, we can actually go and look at the roles. Under this tab, we can see all the different roles for the dashboard, and we can add, remove, or even edit these roles. All the role needs is a name because the assignments are done in the user tab. We can rename or delete these different roles by using the edit button on the side. And that kind of wraps up the account management page. So the purpose of this page is to make the platform more sustainable so that Jason is actually able to manage all the users in one place instead of going through us. Oh no, I need more patient medical info. I need to talk to an admin to get access. No problem. I can quickly create a new role for you and add access to medical information to that role. Thank you. All done. Thank you so much. Now I can start serving patients. Great 
news. Jason said we're going to expand into 3D printing prosthetics. That's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Could you add a new section on the dashboard for that? Yeah, of course. I got you. It's super easy. Do you want to add this section before or after patient information? Could you add it after? Yeah. <laughs> In the last two videos, we saw the section management page being used. So as we showed you guys last semester, on the left we have all the different steps of this dashboard where you have things like medical information or CAD modeling. And if you hit the edit button, you can actually see this new screen up where you can actually change the order of these steps, add a new section, or even delete them. So if we create a new section, you can see things like the section title and also clearance level. Under clearance level, you can give different roles access to the page. And this is kind of where the uh, roles that we saw on the account management page like come into play. And then we can quickly save these changes and now on to the forms within each step. So now we can look at the input fields within each step. These form fields collect the patient information and different files associated with their hearing aid. We can also add fields. So now if we click on add field, we can actually see different settings such as what type of field you want to create, what's the clearance level, is it hidden or shown, and also the field name. So if we were to say give this field the type of multiple select, we can actually see the different form fields. So this is going to have things like the different choices and also the question associated with it. Along with adding fields, we're able to edit fields. So if we actually edit a field, we can see that the very similar options come up. You just can't change the form type. And yeah, so that kind of wraps up the section management page. So again, this is more for sustainability. If Jason has anything that he wants to change within the forms, any new information he wants to collect, any information he wants to change, changing access, he can do it all here and not have to actually contact us and make us change the back end or all that stuff. A lot of the work that we did on the back end for our application this semester involved setting up a dynamic back end and front end that interacted well with each other and allowed users to flexibly add and remove sections and forms for our dashboard without having to directly access the code base, which gives the dashboard a lot of um, flexibility and allows it to be more easily adapted for future use, not only with the hearing aid project, but also any potential future projects that 3 dp for me might want to take on. And we also set up account management pages and um, sort of form addition and uh, editing pages that allow admins to sort of manage which users can interact and access different parts of the application to ensure that our application is completely HIPAA compliant. Now, as you guys have seen, we've had a really great semester working with Jason and the 3 dp for me team, and we're super excited to be working with them for another semester in the fall. So in the fall semester, we're planning on just finishing up the section management page and the account management page, and we're also going to do some general polishing up on the product. Then we're also looking at adding a few more features to the dashboard, one of the main ones being a Trinkle integration. So Trinkle is a software that we're planning on using to auto-generate the CAD models for these hearing aids um, using AI. So that's going to save a lot of time for the volunteers and allow 3 dp for me to really ramp up its output and its impact. And second, we're also looking at adding some sort of maps integration so that it's easier for volunteers to find the addresses of patients if they're going out taking surveys or delivering, delivering uh, hearing aids or anything like that. Uh, now on the 3 dp for me side of things, unfortunately the pilot was pushed back a little bit just because of COVID and regulation issues, but a lot of super exciting things have been happening for 3 dp um, They've got a lot of new volunteers, they've received a lot of generous grants, and they've formed new partnerships over the past few months. So we're looking at having some people on the ground collecting patient information, using our software, and creating hearing aids, hopefully by the end of this summer or by early fall. So we're super excited to see what the next semester has in store for us uh, working with the 3 dp for me team. Great news. <laughs> Great news, Rhea. Jason said we're going to expand it. <laughs> expand into 3D printing prosthetics. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jason said we're going to expand into 3D printing prosthetics as well. Could you create a new section for that on the dashboard?
All right, thank you for um, to the 3DV team for putting that together. Uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions again. I have a question for you guys. What was your um, favorite part about the project this semester? It's a really good question. Um, you know, honestly, I think like my favorite part, like personally, like working on this project was just like seeing like the growth of the team. Like there's like, like every project has like technical challenges um, and all that. And I don't think that's like necessarily unique to any like project in particular. But for me, like the most enjoyable part was just seeing like everybody on our team grow because we had like such a new team. Uh, many of like our members joined uh, last fall. So it was great to see everybody like take on new tasks and challenges um, and be able to really like just learn uh, about like different aspects of uh, like web development, front end, back end, whatever it is that they were working on. Uh, and it was really great to see the progress that uh, Jason's been having with 3DP for me. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I think that was really the best part of the project this semester. Yeah, and then I saw Sahi's question. So, um, like, what do you, uh, can you talk more about your vision for scaling the product? Do you see other nonprofits being able to use this as well or only 3D print for me um, using it in different ways? Uh, we haven't really thought about like other nonprofits being to use it, but, or being able to use it. But um, one thing that we are like kind of hoping like will happen for 3D print for me is that they'll move into prosthetics too. So, that's one thing that we're planning around too is, uh, having them actually be able to, you know, do like prosthetic arms or something like that. And like, kind of like we've generalized the application enough where we can probably support that. And yeah, um, I can also answer the, Matthew, do you want to add anything or? Oh yeah, that's good. So. Okay, um, plans for next semester. Um, Matthew, you can take this one. Yeah, um, so next semester, like our first priority is just gonna be like polishing up a lot of the features that we have right now, just like making sure the UI looks good, making sure everything works, getting some tests written, all that good stuff. Uh, but then like the big ticket item for us like next semester is to have a Trinkle or to have a Trinkle integration within the platform. So uh, I kind of like talked about that briefly in the video, but Trinkle is like a product uh, from some startup in Germany that Jason's uh, got some partnership with. And what they do is, the idea is we're going to upload some ear scan file because uh, the patients collectors, like the, the volunteers are going to go and collect like ear scan information for all the patients that these hearing aids are going to be made for. And normally you would like cat up all this stuff and it would take like 30 minutes to make a 3D model of the hearing aid before it's printed. But with Trinkle, um, it's going to use AI to automatically generate these CAD models, like literally like in a, one or two seconds. So that like cuts down the time of like every individual hearing aid by like 20, 30 minutes. So uh, that's really like the big thing for us next semester. Um, and then I can take the next question by Zion. Um, so uh, we had a lot of different features, um, but like we, mo we mostly focused on the ones that were like kind of uh, first, like the first semester we did stuff focused on the volunteers. Then the second semester we focused on things for the admin just to make sure like the platform is really sustainable. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, we just kind of like specked out like what was like most important, like what would take away the most work from us and if, if anything ever needed changing in the platform while also making sure it's pretty general, but yeah. Like, I, I guess, like, I, I, don't know, I don't know the best way to answer that question, just because, like, we just went for what was the most important. Um, yeah. Uh, I see a hands raised. Is that for a question? Or never mind. All right. Is that all the questions or? Oh, I have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. sorry, there's a little echoing. Um, what was it like seeing the app develop and change over the two semesters? You know, 
that's been something that's like um I don't know like it, it's always like a challenge when you like go in with like one idea and then it changes to the end but I think that's that's something that goes along with like every single like software project that's like ever happened uh, you know like the, the vision always changes but I think like I found like a lot of it really exciting because a lot of the changes that we've been making have been focused on sustainability. So that's really all of our work this semester has been focused on creating that dynamic dashboard. So I, I think for me, it's been like really exciting to see the changes that we're making, even though they weren't originally planned because, um, I mean, you heard Jason talking in the video about how he plans to be using this like at least through the next three to five years, which is super exciting to have like a stakeholder that that's dedicated uh, to using the project. So I think it's been exciting to see the changes that we've made because we know that it's going to have like a really good impact with the longevity of the project. Yeah, and then uh, the last question uh, Sahi asked, it's um, uh, like our relationship with Jason. Uh, yeah, basically like things that like we're pretty like, like like we don't communicate by email anymore. We just, he just like texts us kind of now, like he's added us to like his organization's like base camp. It's kind of like their Slack. Um, and like, I've started getting involved with like other parts of like 3D print for me is like just other operations. And like, I think he's definitely like really invested in like, uh, like Hack for Impact. He really like enjoys like what we do. And I, I'm, he like loves to, he, he really wants to come back and keep like working with us like semester after semester, hopefully until the product is finished, but yeah. Um, Gene, do you want to like elaborate maybe too? Cause I know you worked with him, uh, with Jason and PR. Yeah. So I guess ever since the beginning, um, like the initial stages of PR, Jason always was like super attentive and always tried to, um, I guess, do his best to take initiative and, um, sort of connect us with all the uh, people that could give us all the information that we needed in order to like fully scope out the project initially. And then as well as um, as the project was sort of going on throughout the first semester and the second semester, really, um, if we had any questions and if he really didn't know the answer to some of the questions or if he um, sort of knew somebody that could sort of help us better understand the problem at hand, um, he would always immediately um, sort of connect us with those um, people. I um, mean, and um, always like, even if he had any new ideas or um, just sort of wanted to chat with us about anything, always like send us an email, like, or even just text us. And once, I guess, when we were prepping, um, I was like scrolling through my text with him and accidentally hit the FaceTime button um, and immediately hung up on it. But then he called me back like two minutes later and I was like 11 p.m. in Jordan at the time. And um, even though I told him it was an accident, he still um, you know, asked us how we were doing and um, wanted to check in. And I guess he's just been like really accessible and um, that sort of great relationship with him, I think really helped us um, throughout the entire um, entirety of the project and really looking forward to continuing to working with him um, in the coming semester. So. Yeah. All right, I think we're done with questions. All right, sounds good. So our next uh, presentation or skit is going to be from product research. So unlike the previous presentations, this is not a project team, but another a committee that we have that um, that's responsible for sourcing the projects that we uh, actually partner with in all of the following semesters. So I'll get that started. Hey guys, I heard about a great organization called Hack for Impact that works with amazing nonprofits like YMCA, Falling Fruit, 3DP for Me, and Southside Weekly. I wonder how they find all these great nonprofits. Product Research cold emails a bunch of nonprofits that they care about and talks them through their pain points in order to see how technology can advance their mission. Over the semester, the team typically has three to four calls with a nonprofit in order to figure out what is the type of product that they want to create. They also conduct user research with potential users that some nonprofits provide, validating their problems and concerns. It's a pretty rigorous process, so they must have a really smart team working on this. I heard they have some really great members on the product research team. They have Basu and Arjuna, who are Falling Fruit developers. Um, they have Albert, who's a veteran that joined as a software developer. They have Mustafa, who's a product designer for Southside Weekly. They have Fink, who's a product designer for Mentee. And they also have Sue, who's an external director, and Zayon, who leads the product research team, who is the product research lead. With such a great team, I wonder how many nonprofits they actually contact. Product 
Conduct Research emailed over 100 nonprofits and had 25 plus calls with over 15 of them over the course of a semester. That's a lot of nonprofits. I'm sure they got the chance to talk to some really cool people. Common Good is a nonprofit that promotes community level economic democracy by providing software. Uh, they have a payment processing system uh, that provides transactions free of fees, and they also provide generous grants and loans. Um, they're looking to build a mobile application uh, that will support carrying a balance and finding new common good businesses that will use their credit. Alliance Chicago is a network of public health providers and services in the Chicago land area. They work to improve public health outcomes using technology and cross-network collaboration. From us, they are looking for a portal for their diabetes prediction model, which they develop using machine learning. LearnFresh is an educational nonprofit that provides curriculum and engaging formats for low-income communities such as board games and also partnering with the NBA. Their main initiative right now is actually NBA Math Hoops, where they provide an NBA Math board game where they test math skills like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Right now, they're looking for a mobile app to extend the board game for actual basketball on the courts. So you, they'll be able to work on their math skills and play basketball at the same time. So that's a great team, great nonprofit, and a great mission. What's next for PR? Their current partners love working with Tech for Impact, and they're continuing relationships with them in the fall. Moving forward, they're going to direct their efforts towards helping other chapters and nonprofits across the nation. They're also going to be much more focused in the summer and fall as they look for four to five nonprofits for next spring. I want to do that. Isn't it like a natural transition? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> if you have to ask, no. <laughs> Nonprofit machine learning that. <laughs> what, what, what? Is it machine learning? Oh boy. And loans. Uh, they're looking to build. <laughs> <laughs> Transactions that are. No, that was so natural. It was and we have. Open up. All right, we'll open the floor up for questions first. Um, I think we had a few of our members are curious how the editing and the, um, the spinning stuff all worked. Yeah, so for all the uh, the spinning, it was basically just great camera work from Faith and Vistu. We literally just spun <laughs> from take to take and then stitched it up together all nice. And then, yeah, I did the editing. So he's got a question for the members, so I'll let somebody take one of those. I can go. So one of my favorite things um, being a PR member was just kind of learning about all of the different social issues and missions that nonprofits all over the world were facing and just kind of learning about issues that I never even like knew existed or didn't have much information on. That was very like enlightening and interesting for me. Uh, for me, like the uh, the favorite part was actually the calls because you're getting to talk to someone that's really passionate about what they're doing and they're like know so much about the field that they're in and there's like, like so much information condensed in that like hour phone call where you can like actually see their passion, their drive in what they're doing and like they jump at any opportunity for any kind of help, like whether it's big or small and they're like just very grateful for any sort of you know outreach that they get and like whatever they can do to sort of, you know, further their mission. Yep, and to answer Sabelle's question, Sabelle asked, um, how do you decide which nonprofit is a good fit for Hack for Impact and which is not a good fit? Um, so we consider a lot of things, but um, I'll just highlight a few that we target primarily. So the first one I would say we uh, look at is impact. 
So um, we think about the amount of impact that the nonprofit has on um, whatever area that they're in, whether it's education, healthcare, um, any one of the other, any other area. Um, so impact in terms of um, what's something we build for them, um, how that helps them, and also what impact we have on the nonprofit. So um, you know, if it's like a if it's a huge nonprofit that has a ton of resources, um, we'll only really be doing marginal work for them, but um, if it's a smaller nonprofit that doesn't really have access to those resources, um, we can be a really good, uh, really big help in that way as well. Um, so yeah, that's just like one one big area that we think about in terms of uh, helping out a nonprofit and also um, in terms of validating their pain points. So if they do um, have a like, significant area of um, um, struggle that they're looking to work with um, and looking for technology to help solve that. Um, we look for a unique way to solve that problem. So, you know, if there's something else on the market or um, some other technology technology solution that they could use, we like point them in that direction. But otherwise, if we think that, oh, hey, there's really no, nothing out there that's problem that solve them or solving that problem, then um, that's kind of where we step in. Yep, so he's got another question um, about what the vision for the future of PR is. Um, so the main thing that we, we focus on this semester and will be a continuing theme in the future as well is um, creating better long-term partnerships with our nonprofits. So um, in the past, what we used to do is um, primarily focus on um, like uh, single semester projects. So we would start maybe in September and then, and then December for the fall semester, but um, since then, we have found that you know, nonprofits have really liked working with us, um, as is evident this semester, since um, we're continuing all of our relationships and also, um, you know, trying to work on a little bit more ambitious projects as well. So um, from from the um, initial stages within PR, we would like to um, solidify that um, multi-year uh, or extended partnership with nonprofits and also seeing um, opportunities in terms of um, how we can expand existing solutions. For example, um, Oasis from YMCA, one thing that we explored was whether other YMCAs would be looking for um, um, a solution like that. So looking for other opportunities and how we can best scale our work um, long-term, essentially. All right, with that, uh, we're going to wrap up uh, Q&A time for PR and then move on to our next um, skit and presentation. From back to our project teams, this one is uh, one of our returning projects for the semester uh, being Menti. I did it. Hello, this is my blog. Um, everybody's late except for these two, so. You're responsible. Yeah. All right, are we cool? Okay, yeah, let's go. Hello, do you feel marginalized in your community, but do not know where to go for help? Are you a refugee or immigrant that's having difficulty navigating your new country? Would you like guidance in areas such as citizenship, personal finance, or legal issues? If this sounds like you, check out Menti's new web app. Menti is a nonprofit that offers a network of global specialists and a supportive program to those 18 or older living around the world and marginalized in their own communities. As a Menti, you'll be able to slide, glide, and ride your way through the whole application process, store your information, and at the same time, book appointments with mentors. Now, here's the crazy thing. I will be booking an appointment with myself. So here, Tuesday, 04, 12 a.m., I will be saying hello to myself. And the great thing about this is that we don't ask that much information. This is the page that displays your personal information. If you would like, you can also choose to make your profile public to allow mentees and mentors to find your profile and send you messages. You can also edit your personal information through this modal, where 
you can modify any of the available fields and it will immediately be updated on your profile page as follows. If someone sends you a message, you can view it here. And further communication can be engaged through email. As you can see, the message tab is clearly labeled uh, with an up arrow to indicate that it is clickable and expands upwards. Clicking on it takes them here, which should be a pretty familiar design to most people where they can click on the message and view it. Um, over here is what they see when they click on it um, and important information like their name, email, website, the date and time the message was sent is all viewable here. Since this isn't a typical chat mechanism, we have a large button on the bottom indicating that they can uh, communicate further over email if they wish to do that. One of Letitia's primary goals was to be able to equalize the outreach between mentees and mentors. So it's not just one-sided. So here as a mentor, I'm able to send a message to Andy. And by the moment I send this, they should receive this and we can start a conversation. In addition, as a mentee, you will be able to bookmark mentors that you're interested in having an appointment with. This is a great way to keep track of mentors that you think will help you with your future goals, but may not have the time to meet with right now. And bookmarking them is easy. All you have to do is to just click on the heart icon and they should show up here in your portal. Yusuf Kim, if your angles are not fly enough for your Instagram, check out Yusuf Kim. Standing at 6 feet and 4 inches, Yusuf gets the best angles of your hairline, tops of your ears, and uneven hair parts. Your Insta will be bussin'. Do you want Crocs as merch for Hack for Impact next semester? If yes, join Community Committee. If no, join Community Committee. My name is Lil Ish, and I work at an unnamed hedge fund. The only Capri Sun I drink is the $800 one. And if it doesn't taste good, I'm sending it back. Wow, I love what these nonprofit mentors are doing, and I would love to help out. OMG! Me too! <laughs> You can volunteer. I heard there's an admin portal for the application too. Yes. Hear me out on this one, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that you're able to see each and every single individual mentor, the number of appointments, and if they have specific things on their profile is quite amazing because then you're able to redirect mentees who are seeking mentors. And if those mentors are not having enough appointments, you're set. You can connect them together. That's right, you can easily download all of this data into a spreadsheet for you in order to do further analysis, just like that. Adding additional verified emails is easy. Just open this modal, drag and drop the file you would like to upload, and all the emails in the file should be added to the database. You can also choose between adding mentor emails or mentee emails, and with mentees, you can choose to add a password as well. I don't even know where to get started on this. The fact that you're able to view live data, specifically appointments, and filter through them is quite insane. And don't even get started with the fact that you can view the details too. And download the data here. This is where mentors can apply to be a mentor with a mentee. And based on these applications that are submitted, the admin can actually organize and um, see and review each application. So with all my inputs for the form, I can go and submit it. And I have successfully submitted my uh, mentor application and now the admin can organize it depending if I'm accepted or if I am rejected. Here the admin can move each application to a different column depending on the state of the application. So the admin feels like the application is ready for an offer to be made, it can be in that column, or if it's rejected, it can be in the rejected column. And this helps for the admin to organize the current state of all the applications. 
Click on each card in order to be able to see details of the application for that potential mentor and also add notes. And there, it should be saved in the database and remain persistent. All right, so for the Mentor Application Manager, Bumari and our partnered people to have a straightforward review process in which they're able to easily view all of the applicant's information. So as shown before, here we can view the application by clicking on it. Um, and then uh, over here, um, uh, they can view the application um, and the important stuff is close to the top, the application date, name, contact info, the status, uh, the applicant is at, as well as add notes about what they think of the applicant. Um, and there's also a lot of white space so the information isn't overwhelming and it's easy to digest. Wow, this looks cool. Let's finish with a message from our nonprofit partnered with IIE in Vietnam and Thailand to support my Myanmar refugees. Um, I'm partnered with varying organizations in Sub-Saharan Africa, varying their organizations in 13 countries currently to support those who can best benefit from mentee services. Most recently, I have partnered with the United Nations organization in Lebanon to serve Palestinian refugees, and none of this would be possible without this beautiful, amazing, vibrant, and live platform that Hack for Impact has developed. Their work has been incredible. Every single time they have shown me some of just their rough draft ideas uh, before they're actually live and working, I have been exceptionally impressed, both by, again, the thought that had been put into the, the varying tools that they have built for me, but the design um, and the forethought of things that might I might need down the road. All of these pieces have meant so much to me, and I truly have felt that Hack for Impact was almost a part of Menti. It's always great to hear from our partners directly about um, the impact we can have from, by working with them. Um, I'd like to open up the Q&A for Menti now, and then we'll have one more presentation um, to wrap up today's product showcase. Um, I'm going to ask a question. So I believe you guys like have some people using the application right now. So I was wondering what's some feedback that you received and sort of incorporated um, in the platform second semester. Yeah, so since we launched the application after only one semester, there were a lot of parts of the user flow where we had to take shortcuts, particularly with mentees not having a portal and the admins not having a portal. So one of our first priorities this semester was to consolidate all of the admin functionality that Letitia would usually have to do manually into a really beautiful admin portal so she can view all the data easily and add accounts easily. Um, one of the issues with our registration was actually that um, adding the accounts like directly into MongoDB um, for her manually caused a lot of error, just like from mistyping or miscopying. So um, just automating this for her with the modal that Nyanka made was what, something that definitely helped out with stuff like that. So Alec asked us how we implemented the messaging feature. So actually the messaging isn't a direct messaging feature. Um, all of the communication um, happens outside of our platform. Our platform's just a place, the first point of contact with mentors and mentees can meet or mentees and mentees can meet. So they can fill in a box to send a message to the mentee, but afterwards the mentee will be directed to a link to respond over email. So Zion asked what's next for Menti. So we actually do plan on partnering with them 
for a third semester and a lot of this will be taking in some of the feedback that we receive from current users um, and also just polishing up our product in general. So some things that we found is that users, mentees in different environments may not be able to go to the timed mentorship section. So we want to be able to add asynchronous mentorship and also events and group mentorship so that they have a variety of sessions to choose from and also it'll work with their environments and their struggles. I have a quick question for Kendall. Uh, what was one of the, what was like one of the most challenging technical challenges you guys had this semester? Yeah, I'd say, um, I think there were two main ones. Uh, so the first was the, um, I think, revamping the auth. Uh, in its current state, we were using kind of an outdated um, technology for that. So um, it was a little tricky, uh, particularly because of, um, since we already had users already using the app, we had to kind of migrate them to a new platform. So that was a little tricky. And I think the second one was, um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, as Angela said, we kind of took a few shortcuts in the beginning of the launch uh, with not giving mentees uh, accounts. So um, restructuring pretty much the whole platform to accommodate mentees having accounts was a large um, endeavor task. So that was a big challenge as well. All right, we'll move on to the final presentation for today. So this is um, along with Sots at Weekly, one of our new projects for the semester. So I'm happy to share um, the following fruit presentation and skit with all of you. Although iNaturalist and Seek are excellent educational tools, they would only help the young lad to identify different organisms, not locate them. While the journal aspect of Forager's Diary is practical, it's hard to share your finds. They only support email. Hello there. My name is Ethan. People call me the fruit expert. In 2013, I created a global website containing all the forageable fruit on the planet. But alas, it was only a desktop website. But alas, we made the desktop version first, and the mobile version second. And maintaining these two can sometimes be very hard. Luckily, Half for Impact has worked with Professor Ethan to create a new prototype. Uh, Fallen Fruit is a front-end only project. We're using React, of course, which is a big change away from the collection of scripts that the current apps use towards creating reusable, self-contained components. We're also using Reach UI, which is a UI framework that's pretty different from frameworks like Semantic and Material um, that Hack for Impact has used in the past, in that it's very minimally styled but it's easy to style. So instead, the main advantage it provides is accessibility features like audio labels, keyboard shortcuts, and using semantic HTML5 tags. So the task falls on us to basically style the app from scratch based on Siraj's designs. It's not easy to become bored, but I know that you can be a falling fruit tree. Professor Ethan was gone. Regardless, the young traveler set out with his newly gained Falling Fruit app. The map shows clusters of locations if you're zoomed out, and specific locations if you're zoomed in. I connected the app to the API and backend using API wrappers, and then hooked these up to the map page component to display the locations and the clusters as can be seen below. Within the map, the search bar component allows users to find resources for specific locations in the world. We added suggestions to the search bar and also keyboard tabbing to make these more accessible. 
Once a location is clicked on, the map zooms into that location and shows resources in that area. This page displays location information for an entry. You can see what type of land the location is on, as well as if it's a verified entry or not. You can also find more information about the plants by clicking on the drop down. You can also see there's a description, the address, as well as seasonality included. You can choose to leave a review or report the entry. Additionally, you can choose to edit the location or go back to the map. You can also go back to the page you're on prior. This is not group. Users to provide feedback and information to help other members in the 4G community. After selecting the location, you can see the reviews by scrolling down. Here you can see reviews that other users have submitted. You can also add your own reviews. To do this, you can enter a description and then rank the fruit with these three categories. Optionally, you can take or upload a photo. And when you're done, you click on Publish Review. Despite reviving himself from his previous state, he was no closer to finding out what it meant to be a falling fruit champion. It seems like people used falling fruit for all sorts of reasons. For education, a banana, for hobbies, oh, a clementine, or for subsistence. It's an Armand! Hi! <laughs> but some use it to wreak havoc. How much heard of team pollution? They make urban foraging as difficult as possible. Nah, man, I heard that was an urban legend. Take a look at the list view. Tell me if that's an urban legend. One feature I worked on was the list view. Once you zoom in close enough to see locations on the map, these locations are shown as corresponding entries in this list, sorted by distance to the current center of the map. From the list, you can click on an entry to view its details. On desktop, the, uh, the list view is paginated where each page navigation corresponds to a new API call. And then on mobile, the list view appears as an infinite scroll component where additional API calls are made as you scroll to the bottom of the list. Because there can potentially be thousands of locations shown at a time, delaying these API calls and virtualization of the list component itself were really important parts of this feature. I think this is a pretty interesting feature to build out in design, particularly because of the engineering constraints placed on us when fetching locations for the API. So we look toward similar interfaces like Google Maps for implementations of a list of locations. And from here, the end result is a pretty user-friendly and concise experience that I think allows the user to take full advantage of both the list and the map views. Who would do such a thing? Put locations in the middle of the ocean? Write obscene and uninformative descriptions? It could only be... Team Pollution. I'm gonna put an X this now. I'd like to see you try. Sometimes locations can have various problems associated with them. For example, check out this location in the middle of the ocean. I'm going to report this location to make sure it gets removed. Notice that reCAPTCHA is running in the background to make sure I'm a human. These reports will be reviewed by Falling Fruit administrators who will take action. Even after defeating Team Pollution, I'm nowhere close to becoming a Falling Fruit champion. What will it take? Ready? Go. So say I'm in Hustle Park, Champagne, and I want to add a location for a tree I saw. I can position my map to where the location is. Add one or more types to describe what species are at this location. And fill in the rest of the fields. 
Optionally, I can leave a review to describe my personal experience at this spot. I can also upload photos. And now this location will be available for others to visit and review. Just like that, he joined the international community of foragers, excited to share edible locations all over the world. This is the settings page. You can choose to show the common name as well as the scientific names on the map by selecting the checkbox or the text beside it. You can also choose the map view or the map overlay by selecting one of the tiles. I also worked on the internationalization for this app and translations of languages including Spanish, French, Dutch, Italian, and many more. The React IAT Next framework we used, the language is automatically detected, and the application is then translated to that. We also, however, give users the option to change a language manually on the settings page. For example, here, if I change a language from English to French, it will translate all of the text to French on the re-render. Translations are supported on every feature within the app, from things like the settings page all the way to the specific fruit labels on the locations within the map page component young champion walked off into the sunset with his professor, knowing that his journey was not yet over, at least for one more semester. All right, that wraps up our final uh, presentation and um, see it for today. We're going to open up Q&A for following through. Additionally, if you have any general um, questions for uh, about Hack for Impact and what we've been doing this semester, now would be a great time to ask them after we wrap, um, go through the following through specific questions. Sure, so I could take Zayon's question about what it was like collaborating with Ethan. Uh, in terms of software development. And uh, I think that front end and back end is a pretty natural way to split the project. So it worked out pretty well. Ethan already had a back end, so it's not like he was starting it from scratch. Um, Ethan uh, is the type of uh, nonprofit partner who really like seeks to collaborate with us. So as he's working on the new version of his API, he's also asking us for what we think he can improve on. Um, overall, it was a very good experience. Um, yeah, definitely very lucky to have a, a technical nonprofit client. And I can also take Sahi's next question. What are client calls like? Is there a lot of technical discussion when syncing up since Ethan is working on the API? Um, yeah, it's. I would say it's a 70-30 blend of product and technical discussion. Um, Ethan's a technical man, so we've had a lot of experiences, uh, you know, talking to him, and then he suddenly dives deep into uh, the sophisticated algorithms used in like rendering clusters <laughs> on the back end, which is pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, still uh, some technical discussion recently because we've been giving feedback on the API. Um, so yeah. Um, I guess as for who came up with the idea, it was a collaboration from all of us, but um, I think it was Arman and Archna's kind of like combined idea that really started off. Uh, 
What are you most excited about for next semester? Um, I'd say I'm most excited about user research actually. Um, and so far, like we've been spending a lot of time polishing the product, but we have the entire summer even before next semester to work on user research. And then the semester after for our devs to implement that. Um, Falling Fruit is like a, it's a public facing website, right? Um, and it already has a pretty, pretty large user base. So that's gonna be really important uh, if we plan to release it to the public. I guess to add on to that, um, a lot of the features we've been working on are already present in the Falling Fruit app because we want to replicate the functionality. Um, but I guess in the future, uh, after we kind of finish the core functionality, there's some additional opportunities to build out very interesting features like Siraj's Explore tab idea, as well as um, Ethan's own ideas about um, condensing the interactive types or doing a seasonality filter. Yeah, so Tony um, asked, is there a potential to color code the locations by fruit, berry, nut, or edible leaf? That's one of the sort of stretch goals. Um, right now there isn't that sort of classification, which is kind of tough for users to go through that very big filter list. Um, but yeah, hopefully in the future. Uh, so the next question is, well, there was a question for Siraj, but the next question is, have you guys gone foraging? And not yet, but uh, we are really planning to reach out to the guy at UIUC sometime soon since our app is like mostly done now. Um, so so uh, hopefully before the end of the semester. Um, Sahi asks, what are some takeaways from PR's user research that we incorporated into um, the web app? Um, I guess for the most part, a lot of the users were fairly happy with Falling Fruits. Um, uh, and we really tried to um, incorporate like internationalization that was really important to um, the audience, since so much of the uh, user base is international and not actually based in the US, I believe it's a, around 50% or something like that. Um, it's a very high number. Um, and I guess that was mostly it. Another thing is just um, people kind of want the consistency between the map view and the list view. Um, but that was kind of a tough challenge um, uh, to tackle. Cool, um, I can answer Zion's question in the chat. So his question was, in terms of design, was there a specific type of interaction or behavior that you focused on, like finding fruits opposed to logging new locations or foraging slash adding resources? So that's a pretty good question. Um, I think this is something that we actually, consider, I considered a lot when making the design, which is mostly like what types of users are using the application. So one, super users and regular users. So beginners might not be entering like coordinates, like latitude, longitude might be looking for locations or just like apples near them or something that's more accessible, while experts might be looking for like trees to tap and something that's more complex or they have more materials for. Um, so that was one consideration. Um, and then as well as like, are people like lurkers or do they just like go through the app to look for things or are they contributing? And like, how can we make more of a universal design for all of those flows? So yeah, that's definitely something we considered. Um, I think the prominence of features in terms of like where the add location button is in relevance to finding things, just like looking for foraging items was pretty important. So lay, that really did influence the layout and prominence of certain components in the application. All right, so that wraps up our questions for, day, for today. Thank you so much to all of the different presentations that we watched today. Um, I'm going to be doing some just quick announcements before we wrap everything up here, so. Should we have people fill out the form beforehand? Well, yes. Memory is still fresh. 
So, so vote for who gets the best actor Oscar award in the form I just said. All right, so while you guys are filling that out, I'm going to get started with the rest of our announcements. So director and leads applications are going to be released today. So we're looking for an external director and a tech director to join us. This is open to people in and outside of Hack for Impact UIUC currently. And in the fall, for those who are not current members, we will also be recruiting for academy members, software developers, and product designers. Um, in August. So stay tuned for that. But these applications will be going out today. It'll be on our Instagram. It'll be everywhere. And they'll be closing in two weeks from now. And then internally from there, additionally, we will be having um, leads applications opening too. So that'll be academy lead, tech lead, product manager, product research lead. Both of those apps do at the same time. Um, then um, Yusuf, if you'd like to talk about React course and then um, so I will talking about senior send off next week. Yeah, so we have uh, something planned for next Sunday for the React course, 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, we're in talks with, I don't want to give too much away, but we're, we're talking uh, and, and getting it set up. Um, but yeah, we'll keep you guys updated for that. Get excited. Steering all hands so we know you guys are all free since we don't have all hands that week. So show up. And um, after finals have ended, um, so next Sunday, during our normal all hands meeting time, we're going to be sending off all our graduating seniors in Hack for Impact. Um, so we'll be putting together some videos for them and we're gonna be doing this um, meeting up on Gather Town and then later on, I think exploring some of our Minecraft uh, buildings that we've built last year for Hack for Impact. Cool, cool. And then the final announcement from me is that over the next week or two, we will be conducting 1v1s with all the members. So sign up via Calendly for those meetings with the directors. Some of them might be via Zoom or in person, depending on the schedule. So um, a lot of different directors are going to have different schedules over the next few weeks. So pick whatever director you feel most comfortable with talking to. And if you can't find a time available, feel free to reach out to them on your own time to figure out what works best for you guys there. So um, without further ado, we have our Oscar portion, if anyone, <laughs> if you said you could be monitoring that because I can't um, look at it right now. Yeah. Uh, are we announcing it now? Oh, do you want to not? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Just get your votes and I'll give you like five seconds if you haven't voted yet. Okay, and the Oscar goes to Sean. Congratulations. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, we'll be getting you like an actual Oscar. Like, a, you know, the real ones, you know. We don't, we don't do any of the fake stuff, so don't worry. And then thanks again for everyone for coming out and acting in your videos. It was really great to see the impact that Hacker Impact has made within our various different web apps this semester and on our nonprofit partners. We got to hear from a variety of them today virtually, and uh, we have so much to be proud of. And I hope you guys um, feel like you're part of something bigger than just yourselves. I will see you guys all hopefully within the next two weeks. We'll have um, as mentioned, the React course send off and the senior send uh, React course and conclusion, as well as the senior send off, um, and with incoming announcements in our Slack channel. Yeah, um, Arvin, do you have any ending messages? Yeah, I'm super proud of all the work that's been done over the past few semesters. I know um, pandemic uh, can be trying for all of us, uh, whether you're on campus, off campus. Um, got a lot going on um, in, in school and other things. And so um, it's been great to see the work that's been going on with our old, like some of our old projects, um, continuing from last fall as well as the new project this semester. Um, super proud of everything 
that all of you have been able to accomplish and seeing um, how you all members have grown over the course of the pandemic and taking the initiative to go above and beyond what we asked for. So I'm super excited to see what happens um, for all these projects as they continue. And I'm super excited to see uh, what you all will also do um, in the future Factor Impact and beyond. All right, cool. So um, that concludes our meeting. I will probably be hanging out around. Oh, wait, wait, yeah. Multiple people can annotate. I didn't even know that. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to annotate on this, <laughs> um, feel free to do so. <laughs> but yeah, that concludes it. Cool. This is actually kind of a cute drawing, so feel free to <laughs> keep contributing to this. <laughs> Arpin, I noticed that your parents are here. Do they have any messages to give to us as proud parents of one in the chat? <laughs> oh, I see. Very cute. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I can just about wrap things up then just take a screenshot of our last little diagram. Yeah.